Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to introduce yourself and then Louise, and then we'll launch into our questions. Sure. So, um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Berger. Uh, I <coughs> I uh, do executive coaching for clients across multiple organizations, and uh, and I also write for Forbes and Psychology Today. And I'm really happy to be here. I'm a I'm a forum for uh, facilitator out of Broward, and so I work with an executive forum there. And happy to be here with everyone. Louise, you have to unmute. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, Louise Poirier, I'm the president of Guiding Shift. Uh, Guiding Shift is a consulting company. I focus mainly on executive coaching, uh, organization development consulting, and I also mentor heads of HR. Um, I've had my business for five years. Prior to that, I was uh, head of human resources in um, large commercial construction company. Uh, it was a uh, $4.8 billion a year company, and I had responsibility for four states and different HR teams in those states. So I'm glad to be here with you today. Great. It's been five years already. Jeez. I feel like in the last it two months, been. It I've been. aged five years. But don't worry, be happy. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Great, and, and I see Gail, Absolutely. Gail Carson has just joined us. Hi, Gail. And Gail facilitates our, um, our first not-for-profit executive forum. So here is our first question, and Laura, we'll start with you. My team is a mess. Where do I even start? <laughs> oh, that's such a loaded question. Well, I think yeah. <laughs> I'm going to answer that uh, in a, a very holistic way, uh, based on what everyone says they're struggling with. You know, I, I, think, I think everyone is in very different places. So uh, to uh, an earlier comment, you know, there are some individuals that are really thriving this virtual environment. And there are those that are not, which is why where we're sitting right now is this, this pull of, well, we're going back to the office, but I don't want to go back to the office. And a lot of companies are struggling with that. And I, I, think, I think what's really imperative right now is to get a pulse of where each individual team member is and what is going to serve them best, quite frankly, because in order to serve them best, in order for them to serve the organization best, they need to be in a place where they feel that um, they are comfortable. And, and part of that is, you know, the physical safety, the psychological safety of like coming back into the office. And I think that that's the first thing where do you even start? It's that you need to get a pulse on every single individual. And, uh, and we've been doing that. I work with a lot of clients uh, across the globe. And we've been doing that through workshops. Uh, we've done a get centered, get connected, get creative workshop where we've had, you know, 300 and 300 plus employees on that those calls to help understand what's going on and so the company can respond appropriately to the issues that are coming forward. Great. Thank you. Louise, your turn. Okay. So uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, I, all, I, I don't like going after Laura. Right, because she comes up with all the great answers, and then it's like, okay, where do I, where do I pitch in? Right, where do I add value? I, you know, so it was good to get the uh, questions ahead of time, so I could think, okay, from what perspective? Because you're right, Laura, this is a loaded question. Where do you start? Right. Um, so I looked at it not so much from uh, remote people coming back. I looked at it for building collaborative teams when. You know, I, I looked at this, my team's a mess. Where do I even start with building collaboration within the team? So I looked at it in terms of um, asking yourself, you know, first, 
why are they a mess and why why do they not want to collaborate and I looked at, it could fall into three different buckets, right? When I look at a team is a mess, they're not collaborating. Then I look at three buckets. One bucket could be is that they don't get it. They don't understand the value of collaboration, right? And they don't understand it from what's in it for them individually, what's in it for the team collectively, and where's the value of working collaboratively. So that's one bucket, right? I don't get it. The second bucket is I don't know how or I don't know when. What does it look like, right? So that's more of a skill set and that's more of a competencies of knowing how and when to collaborate and doing it well. And then the third bucket is, well, I really don't want to. I really don't care to, right? Uh, and so I did, I, I'm not doing it because I don't want to, right? So depending on, so as you assess that and you say, okay, as I look at my team, this mess of a team that's not working collaboratively together, which one of these three buckets probably um, addresses it most closely? So that if it's the first bucket and it's more that they don't get it, then maybe we need to have some discussion on the greater good of the whole and collectively, how are we better off, right? So we're talking about creating awareness and creating a level of understanding of benefits and maybe generating some commitment from there. If it's a second bucket, they don't know how and they don't know when, then that's education, that's training, that's um, getting an understanding of how it's going to look like and how we're going to measure our success. But if it's the third one where you have one or a couple of team members who don't care and just don't want to, well, that that might be a different uh, situation altogether. You may need to address that and you may need to look at making some changes um, with your team. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I took that from that perspective. Yeah. Number three sounds like the hardest one. Uh, number three is definitely the hardest one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Louise, we'll start with you on this question. Please provide your insight and tips on building strong collaborative teams remotely beyond the basics. Okay, well, so I said uh, the basics to me is you just set them up correctly. So let me just categorize what I put in the basics. And then I won't talk about that because you want beyond the basics. And then I'll, I'll provide some perspective of beyond the basics. So to me, what I put down as the basics are you already have clear goals. Everybody understands their role. Everybody understands their responsibilities. The milestones are there to track progress. Uh, you have metrics so we can see how we're doing. You have clear measures of success. And by that, I mean, it's very clearly articulated what good looks like so that we're evaluating how well we're doing, not just did we reach uh, a goal or a milestone, but we um, also know what good looks like so we can look at the quality also. And you have some accountability measures. Make sure everybody does what they say they're going to do. So I put, and then you'll, you need the, the good communication vehicles and the good technology tools. So I put all of that in, well, that's basic stuff, right? So what can I offer beyond the basics, assuming that you have all of these things in place? The, the, the two quick things that I would offer is one, uh, celebrations, frequent and open celebrations of progress towards those milestones and the contributions of each other. And I think that might even fall in the basics, right? But the other one that I've seen with some of my clients that really has proven effective, and we don't necessarily put that as part of the plan of working remotely but collaboratively, is to have a methodology or an approach for issue clearance. Because stuff happens. And it doesn't always go well, whether it's the initiative, the collaboration itself, part of the project you're working on, stuff happens. And we don't necessarily have a way of addressing or clearing issues when we're working remotely. We have a tendency of maybe calling somebody after the interaction and saying, wasn't that lame, or making comments, but how do we do that together? 
So establishing a method of issue clearance, one of my clients, they came up, I kid you not, this was so neat. They came, do you remember uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, the, the movie, right, Yellow Submarine? And do you remember the green meanies? No. Right, the, the big green meanie monsters and all that that were coming out of closets and so on. So they just coined, is there a green meanie? Is there something lurking behind a closed door that really sh we should service and we need to talk it through because it's getting in the way of collaboration. It's getting in the way of effective teamwork and it needs to surface, but it's kind of like awkward. So they just named it the green meanies. Okay. And so at the end of every meeting, like this one, like a Zoom meeting or other, they would celebrate somebody's uh, uh, accomplishment, right? But then they would say, okay, green meanies. And that was an, and they made it part, a normal part of discussion. And they talked about how do you raise it to where it's not offensive, it's not um, uh, attacking, but how do you raise a green meanie for uh, clearing that issue so that then you, it can go away? So that's it. Thank you. Laura. Yep. You're up. Laura Berger. Okay. Louise, I think you pretty much covered it. Um, the, well, this kind of ties into the green meanies, uh, is, is having in place that, uh, that protocol for escalating issues. Right. And yep. I would take it, I would take it to the, <laughs> to the extent that the protocol is picking up the phone which is a very basic thing but you would be surprised how many people turn to teams and are instant messaging back and forth and spending so much time on this back and forth which is being misinterpreted because when you're looking at an im you're interpreting it the way that you're feeling and and maybe you're feeling this person is shouting at you or uh, right. or what have you and so the conversations where I have been, you know, getting pulled into lately is it's the area of escalation because things are changing so quickly and, and people don't necessarily, they're not, they're, they're using the easy go to hide behind the I am strategy, which is a very, very, very poor strategy, quite frankly because it just creates more energy drain and you're not getting to the issue at hand. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question, and Laura, we'll start with you. How do you keep the engagement, motivation, and productivity without sounding like you are spying on or not trusting your team? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, this is this is tricky, and it's based off it's based on you know what you as an organization can do. Now, I I can share with you that um, so I work with a large insurance company, and uh, they they were struggling with are they being productive? Are they you know that that was their biggest issue? And I think someone had mentioned they're in sales, and it's like how do you how do you continue to you know stay connected with your colleagues and your clients and your prospects and and so there was definitely that feeling underlying of i don't i, I don't know if i can trust this person that they're doing yeah. work and getting things done and um the, the way that they they uh initiated it was they brought they brought someone in from the outside and you you can you can do this you know pro bono too because what I'm sharing right now I actually did a pro bono for this client where uh, through Zoom we we set up a platform and we talked to um, everyone about what their concerns were at the company uh, and we used annotation. Annotation is a great way to capture things in an anonymous fashion versus mm -hmm. the chat because chat your name is actually attached to it. So having the ability to be able to capture the concerns uh, of everyone was a great way for then the company to have a better understanding of what they were actually dealing with and then to respond to it in a way where they set up team leads of pods like people started creating pods within the organization to uh to then 
keep a, a pulse check on how that person was doing personally. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a call of being done. It was, how are you doing? How is your well being? It was that, it was that type of conversation. And so having a team lead to actually facilitate that and then rotate that team lead. So it's not always the same person because you want to help create engagement collectively as a team. That's going to help foster trust and, and build more of a, a collaborative environment because now people are connecting on a personal level of what they're experiencing and feeling a sense of, uh, of empathy and compassion for where people are coming from. So then the next time that so-and-so doesn't dial in to the call and isn't showing up on Zoom, you're not sitting there going, oh, well, that person's being unproductive. It's, oh, you know, their kid probably, you know, threw a, a hairbrush down the toilet. I mean, you know, like this stuff is happening these days. So. <laughs> and now they're dealing with a plumbing issue, right? So, <laughs> Louise, same question. Yeah, that's, that's so true. You don't know what's happening in someone's house right now. You, you definitely don't. Um, I'll take the same question, but yes. I'll look at it whether okay. it's um, uh, whether we're working, working remotely or we're working together. Right. Uh, a lot of my clients, they are still coming into the office. The majority of the people have been in the office. Some of them, it's uh, uh, it, coming back in terms of phase one, but some of them are, are still working together. And I'm looking at, you know, look at customizing, pretty much like what Laura was saying, get to know what's important to your team, and, and, um, and that's a good starting point. But from an engagement standpoint, looking at um, giving the team members a voice in terms of crafting how they're going to work together, right, uh, uh, whether that's remotely and, and how they're going to dial in and what they want the meetings to look like and be like and the focus and so on, but giving them a voice and getting them engaged in crafting that. From a motivation standpoint, I looked at, you know, um, the old thing, how do you, it, you can bring a horse to water, but how do you make them drink, right? So how do you motivate somebody, right? Well, find out what makes them thirsty, right? So again, that's more of a, from an individual standpoint. So looking what that what floats their boat, is it career advancement? Is it more autonomy, decision making? What is it? And then let's uh, um, focus on maybe crafting individual uh, plans for uh, your team members that helps keep them motivated. So from an engagement perspective, give them a voice, include them, get them involved in the work that affects them. Uh, from a motivation, find out what makes them thirsty and help them craft a plan to head in that direction. And then I look in terms of productivity, um, you know, um, provide tools and communication that helps them assess how well they're doing, right? And um, so the expectations are, are clear. Uh, I had someone um, ask me, you know, I'm not sure, and it came up when Laura was talking, you know, I don't know if I trust this person, you know, to work remotely without supervision. And I said, well, how closely do you supervise them when they're in the office? Well, not that closely. Okay, then how do you measure productivity <laughs> when they're in the office if you're not hovering over them, right? And, and the answer was, well, by the output, by the deliverables. Mm -hmm. And how, why does that need to be different just because you're working remotely, right? So what are the productivity goals? What are the performance goals? And in terms of volume, in terms of timeliness, in terms of quality, and you may need to be a little bit more creative or a little bit more thoughtful about how we communicate that from a remote standpoint. Uh, one of my clients started dashboards, uh, mm -hmm. and it lent itself well to meetings such as this one, to where we can see each other, but sometimes a screen is we're looking at the dashboard. And this was a team of uh, human resources, um, and it was talent acquisition recruiters. And um, there was a little bit of healthy competition. You have to make sure that it doesn't... Um, 
uh, uh, it's not intended to show off or to exploit deficiencies in, in performance, right? But uh, the uh, director of HR had an individual discussion with each one, let them know that there would be a dashboard and what would be measured, and that all team members in the department would have visibility to the dashboard. And then they started showing uh, number of open positions that each one was handling, the time to fill the position, uh, and all the different metrics so they could see that dashboard. Well, let me tell you, productivity increased because there was some healthy competition in terms of time to fill with the right candidates, right? So that's one way that you can do it without demonstrating lack of trust or without micromanaging. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sounds a little bit like the theory behind Orange Theory Fitness, where everyone's flashed on the screen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Louise, the next question will start with you. And it is, how can you put the Zoom, the fun, back into Zoom with your team? Okay, well, Laura, you're ready for this because I am so deferring to you on this one. Oh, <laughs> I, you know, you know and, and let me tell you why. Okay, look at my background. Look at Laura's background. <laughs> All right, funny. do you see why I'm deferring to Laura? She <laughs> is the Zoom expert. I am definitely not. So I am, I, I'm throwing this right at you. Okay, okay. Well, so, um, <laughs> I actually wrote a piece for uh, Forbes around this, and I talked about uh, bringing improv into the workplace in a virtual setting. And, and what is the value of that? Well, particularly it, in a virtual setting, think about how when we're face to face, our active listening skills are very challenged. Now put us in a virtual environment and think how our active listening skills are then, right? So, uh, so as, as much as we're sitting here talking about productivity, I think it's really important to put into place some, uh, some activities that tap into your active listening to help, you know, massage that muscle. So, uh, for example, there's a, if any of you are familiar with improv, there's the yes and scenario. So when you're in an ideation type of session, instead of shooting something down, you are responding yes and. Now, why, does that, why is that important? And how does that help your active listening? Well, first of all, you have to add to that conversation versus but which means you just have what you're stating to get your you know, opinion across in disagreement. So that means you might have not even listened to begin with versus if you're adding to something, it's stimulating that part of your brain into active listening. So you can turn this into a game and say, okay, everybody, we're going to get on this call. We're going to talk about this project. We've got you know, this going on in, the, in, in operations right now. And the way we're going to contribute to this is through yes and. And that engages everyone in, oh, I really have to listen now because I need to add in a positive, powerful way to whatever we're discussing. So I, I, would, I would say first and foremost that that's something that you can apply um, across all of your team meetings that you're having which then will increase productivity, quite frankly. But it sounds like a fun, you know, crazy thing to do because it's tied to improv. Uh, the other thing is, and this is just in my client conversations, you know, some people have pulled together virtual bingo uh, and have sent me all the files on it of like, oh, we're doing this virtual bingo. It takes, you know, 10 minutes. Some of it was related to COVID, COVID words. Some of it wasn't. Uh, and, and that's just a, a way to just kind of bring things fun back into the work environment. I have a client today that is doing a virtual uh, cooking uh, scenario where she, uh, baking, excuse me, uh, sent ingredients to her team. It's a, it's a small team. It's like probably 15 people. And, uh, and they're all going to, to bake cookies. I'm not sure what they're baking, but they're they're doing that at, as a as a team building activity, and they're and they're also using Zoom on on a Friday, similar to the you know I think Bailey was saying, oh it's a 
it's casual Friday, they're taking Fridays and, and making that, that time frame for them to do fun activities as a group. I, I, have, I have so many that I could come up with, but, or that I can share with you that so many clients have been you know, implementing for themselves. Um, but those are the, those are the two that, that come to mind uh, specifically. Can you give a, an example of a yes and that you saw really work? Um, well, I mean, it, it's, uh, well, I can give you an example. I, I didn't see it work because I wasn't there observing it, uh, but I heard the outcome. And this actually also speaks to, uh, to the question, uh, you built a collaborative team in your own division, but we but we're having problems with another team of resisting. So this was with the COO of a of a manufacturing company, and then the the vice the vice president in charge of um of uh, uh, operations and and uh, production, right? So they're they're crazy busy, and and they had been having conflict. Uh, and I'm actually working with both leaders. They were having conflict uh, around, I just can't be bothered by that. I just can't be bothered by that. And they were constantly positioning every time, and they were doing it through IM. So I said, hey, guys, <laughs> this is not working. <laughs> you need to change your strategy, right? And so we got very clear about the conversation that they were going to have. And I said, now I want you to pick up the phone and move through the entire conversation, yes, and. So it was a back and forth, yes and, yes and, and it and it moved them from what I will call a positional conversation to a co-creative conversation because then they were able to create a story together as to how they were going to manage what was going on in the plant and and how the COO was going to be involved and who he was going to bring back you know into that conversation. And so that's an example of a, a conflict that you're dealing with it where applying yes and, and it's so simple. It's just people just have to, to bring it into the conversation. Great. Uh, so, and, and we'll go back to that question a little bit more too. Our next question, and Louise, we'll start with you on this one. Okay. What is the best way to help each team member that each person has the best intent or at least coming to the table with that assumption first and foremost. It sounds like that probably ties a little bit more into the trust too. Best right. way to help each team member that they're the best intent or at least coming to the table with that assumption first and foremost. Okay, so I'm assuming from that that we have situation here to where some people come to the table, try to make a contribution, and somebody else's eyes are rolling or like, oh my gosh, right? So there's, uh, uh, so they don't necessarily assume positive intent when the person is making that contribution. That's how I read this, right? So I'm going to answer it from from that perspective. Um, I think it's. Um, as a leader, it, we have to start with reinforcing that we should assume positive intent, right? But reinforcing it and saying it uh, makes sense and people can get it intellectually. Well, of course, I, I need to assume positive intent. But when push comes to shove and you're in a situation, it doesn't necessarily come naturally to assume the positive intent. There's a reaction, right? That someone makes a contribution of whatever sorts and we react to it, right? And based on our reaction, um, we then draw a conclusion that, a, a, a negative conclusion, right? They can't be trusted. They have their own separate agenda. They're lame. They're unprepared. Uh, that's not going to work. We tried it last time, right? So you make a, a judgment. And so you can talk about assuming positive intent, but I think as a leader, we have to recognize it. And then we have to do some coaching. You can do uh, 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 team coaching in terms of how do we challenge our assumptions. But then you can do some individual coaching with those who might need a little bit more help. And I've used two different approaches. One approach is to identify your assumption, right? So if I'm coaching someone who says, you know, Lori, 
Every time she comes to the meeting, she makes lame comments that are completely unrelated and we get lost. We go down rabbit trails. You know, I just wish Lori would stop doing that, right? Well, as a leader, now you have an opportunity to say, okay, this is the assumption that you're making. And then I challenge them to come up with three different other perspectives of what could be the case, and they all have to be positive, mm -hmm. right? So you train them to challenge their assumption, right? And then you help them through the process as of those three, and they have to be realistic, of course, of those three, which one is most likely? And if you're right, and that's a perspective that they're offering, now what is your, instead of reaction, what is your response to that? Mm -hmm. So that's one approach that I use. The other one, when someone will say, ugh, whatever the follows the ugh, right? Um, so I'm going to say, okay, your gut is telling you something. Two things. One, trust your gut. If it doesn't sound right, if it doesn't seem right, there's something there. Trust your gut. Go there. Number two, challenge your gut. What evidence do you have, right, that your gut is right? You may be right, but challenge your gut, right? And so I'll, I'll have them name the emotion, right? Because the uh and what comes after, there's an emotion there. Is that anger? Is that hurt? Is that resentment? Is that uh, frustration? Name the emotion, right? And then take that emotion, don't ignore it. Name it, recognize it, but ever so gently park it over here for a minute, right? We're gonna get back to it. We're not ignoring the emotion, but we're separating the emotion from the real issue, then when you do that, what is the real business issue that you're trying to deal with? Resolve that issue, then go back and bring back the emotion. Most of the time when you do that, the emotion, it was like, why was I so upset to begin with, right? When you can recognize it and separate it. So those are two different techniques of how we can train uh, team members of how to assume positive intent. Great, thanks. Laura? I'm just going to add to what uh, Louise said. Uh, the, the naming the emotions, so the science behind that, the neuroscience behind that is when you are able to name an emotion, even if it is a negative emotion, you are going to lower the amygdala's response by deregulating your cortisol levels. So just by doing that, you're going to deregulate cortisol levels, which creates stress in others, just through labeling it, just to like, I am really angry, right? right? So that in itself will allow you to then access your prefrontal cortex, which is where more strategic type of thought process yep. comes into play. Because when you're hanging on something and you haven't been able to name the emotion, your brain, the neurotransmitters, are not even going to be able to connect up to your prefrontal cortex. So that in itself is so critical. And you can go out and you could, UCLA has done research on it. I could send you, you know, globs and globs of studies around it. Um, but but that is, is a definite uh, way to kind of uh, shift uh, negative, uh, negative intent or, or uh, bias that might be yeah. percolating. Just one more thing to add on top of that, Laura. It, um, it's also supported, are you familiar with red zone, blue zone? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's in direct support with what you're talking about. And there was, uh, there's a book, Red Zone, Blue Zone, written, Dr. Osterhaus and someone else, I don't remember who else. And it's exactly the uh, uh, different parts of the brain that get enacted when they're stressed and yeah. so on. So excellent. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And then our last question before we open it up for any additional questions, we've got about 15 minutes left, is, and uh, Laura, we start with you. You've mm -hmm. built a collaborative team in your own division, and we, we started addressing this already, but when you have to work with another division, they resist collaborative work. How do you help your team from becoming frustrated in these situations? 
So I'm going to provide one tool and it is a tool that uh, several clients have shared with their team members and, and, and continue to use. And it's incredibly simple. It's a book by Don Miguel Ruiz. Many of you may have heard of it called the four agreements and the four agreements are always do your best, assume positive intent, be impeccable with your words, and don't take things personally. This is so critical now in a virtual environment that if you have that up on your screen and somebody's sending you an IM that's kind of annoying you and you're, you're taking it personally, okay, don't take this personally. This is probably not about me, this is probably about them. Assume positive intent, right? And the be impeccable with your word, you're in a remote setting. There's a lot of trust issues going on. If you say you're going to deliver on something, deliver on something, right? If you're not delivering on it, then, hey, you know what? Let people know what is going on and what is getting in the way of that. And, and always do your best. We are striving to always do our best. But there are moments where we get in ruts, and it's a good reminder of like, am I really putting my best foot forward? What could I be doing differently here so that I am always doing my best and, and recognizing that and pivoting in the moment. So that, that is the, that is how you work in a collaborative team. That is how you work with other teams that may not be, you know, so collaborative with you is sharing that and, and embodying that into your daily life, both personally and professionally. And it, and it has, uh, created a sense of brilliance for the clients that have really stuck with it and implemented it and they they still go on and on about it so and sounds, it's not my book <laughs> sounds like it might be a big ideas beyond the book book we should look at it, it's great it's yeah. easy it's small yeah. it's simple yeah great louise yeah. um i love that i really love that and i wrote it down because i want to check that out the four agreements i think it's simple um and uh but easy uh, simple easy to understand and i think maybe easy to apply as well right so i like that a lot um a client of mine and I, we just had a similar situation to where two departments one is highly collaborative they're an hr team right and then they're dealing with another department that um uh, uh, they think is not as collaborative, right? And so what was happening is the HR team, it's HR and payroll, and payroll belongs in the finance department. And so HR does the data entry for payroll, right? Does the data entry, and then the payroll department processes the pay, right? And so here's what was happening. So things are late. And there are some errors. So instead of having conversation on how do we handle this, there's nasty emails that are coming from payroll to HR, copying every executive that that's affiliated with the organization, right? And so HR, the emotion is hurt, right? And uh, uh, and now there's a lack of trust, and there's an issue, right? that they're not collaborating and they're not working together. So the head of HR goes to her boss, right? Chief administrative officer. And he says, well, go play nice, right? Just go play nice, right? Just collaborate, just figure it out and just collaborate. So what we did similar to what you're talking about, Laura, but I used lesson number four. There are 10 lessons, but lesson number four is stay grounded. Recognize when negative emotions get in the way. Unpack the situation recognize detach the emotional component to reveal the real business issue get grounded on resolving the issue revisit the emotion from a new perspective and what what we did to do that i said okay so what is the emotion well we're insulted we're embarrassed right because everybody's being copied and so on so we named the emotion and again what we did is we recognized it and we gently put it to the side and I said, what's happening? What is the real business issue? The real business issue is that errors continue to be made in data entry and it is submitted late. 
right? So that puts more stress on payroll to do what they need to do. And it's important to get people paid on time, right? So these are, and I said, is it because the volume has changed or is it because they don't know how, right? Because errors, right? And, and timeliness. She said, well, we're late. And I guess we can own that. I said, well, what about the errors? Is it the same errors over and over again, which could be performance issues, or is it new errors? Well, new errors. How long has this been going on? Fairly new. What has transpired? Well, we hired a bunch of new people. And how well were they trained? Well, I guess we didn't train them too well. Who owns this? She said, I guess I do. I said, okay. So you own the training, you own the audit controls, and you own the timeliness. Yes, I guess I own that. Okay, right? So when you can remove the emotion, detach it just temporarily to look at what the real business issue and just ask yourself some questions in terms of what's currently happening here. If you remove the emotion, what's the business issue? And you break it down. Then she came up with an action plan, went to uh, payroll, and asked for their help in providing the training. Now they're working collaboratively. She went to payroll and she said, our bad, we keep making errors and we're late and it's causing issues. Can you help with training? Absolutely, right? And so maybe removing and looking at what the real business issue is and dealing with resolving that then revisiting the emotion. Great, thank you. So we have a little bit of time um, to take some questions. And you know, one of the things, Laura and, and Louise, you were making me think about um, is that in the, with the I, not, you know, I am or even emails, I try so hard. And some of the times I, I have to stop myself because I've gotten an email and I've created this whole story around it. And it's really hard <laughs> not to keep going right. down that rabbit hole but, you know, right. a lot of times I have to go, nope, nope. You know, I just made up a whole nother reality that's, you know, completely false. So right. it's, that's, that's really, that's a very difficult challenge. But I guess the first step is recognizing that you do that. Yeah. So we have, again, we've got um, about six more minutes. If, we, if anyone wants to um, ask a question from the floor, please unmute yourself and ask it or add any any of your own tips or something that's working for you as you're managing your teams. Now's our chance. I have a question. Um, and I, I just actually got a name for this yesterday. So now I feel like I can understand it more, but um, how do you manage um, dumping versus delegation? Like that whole distinction between delegating <laughs> something or dumping something. And if you are the dump recipient or your team is the dump recipient consistently, um, uh, which I, I realize now happens often from a mar with a marketing team. How do you manage that? Okay. Who wants to take that? Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll start and Laura jump in. Yeah. Okay. Um, I start, so you're talking about a department to where they, they, they become, I call it the big black hole. They start becoming the big black hole and stuff starts being thrown over the fence into your lap and it's like what what the heck what are we becoming why are we responsible for that is that where you're coming from Lindsay? yeah i think from a marketing communication standpoint yeah, just to put, yeah i think anything that has writing all of a sudden becomes communications where it right might not be right right um i typically ask who owns this who's the owner right? Who's driving? And then they say, well, what do you mean who owns it? They gave it to us to do. Yeah, yeah, but who owns this? Who's the ultimate decision maker, right? And where does the buck stop on this, right? And so then you can trace it back to, if you can trace it to who owns it, then you can have a conversation with who should do it, right? Who owns it? And then who should do it? And are you asking us for our assistance, right? So from a marketing and communication standpoint, if you had, the other thing is, if you have a um, well-articulated, well-understood charter, here's what we do. Here's what we don't do, right? And that is uh, communicated 
when something comes over the fence and lands on your lap, and you can trace it back to who really owns this, then you can have a conversation of, this doesn't nice and neatly fit in here. Let's figure out together who should be helping to support you in doing that, right? And you may own a piece of it, but you may not own the whole thing. Does that make sense? Yes, that's helpful. Okay. Laura, anything Laura. to add? Uh, yeah, I, I would add because I'm – you can you can be direct and and uh, kind at the same time, and I I would look at you know this actually just happened to me that's why I was laughing. <laughs> I I would uh, I would look at what was sent to me, and I would say this is the areas in which I can help you, and this is what I need from you. Mm -hmm. in order to do that right? right so you're kind of handing it back over this messy whatever they threw in your lap um, with very clear direction and coming from a creative space versus a positional one um, right that's that's what I would do and then they're like oh okay I get it because I'm not yeah. saying no right or it uh, may just, not be that important to get done when you're asking for their engagement. Right. And that, and that has definitely happened where it's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, we, I can't work on that right now. So right. that gets back burnered and okay, I'm, I'm off the hook, right? <laughs> so. There was a, another situation that um, uh, it, um, she, this lady was telling me, well, they come to me because they know it's going to get done. But now they keep coming to me for things that they should be going to others for. I want to be serviceable. I don't want to say no, but this has got to stop because it's not scalable. <laughs> and so what we identified, she's been trying it and it's working. So when she'll get an executive that says, can you please? And so what she'll do is she'll say, absolutely. Uh, and I'll use Laura for an example. She'll say, uh, Laura handles that. It'd be my pleasure to work with Laura to make sure that this gets done for you, right? Then she goes to Laura and says, the executive asked for that. What can I help you with? Do you have it from here? Hands it over, right? But then there's got to be a feedback loop, a follow-up to make sure it was taken care of, right? And what you're basically doing is training people to go to the appropriate parties anyways, right? But you're not being unserviceable and you're not saying no. Mm -hmm. It's a and yes think, and kind of yeah, situation. It is a yes and kind of thing, right. And it's one, a yes and. One other thing I just want to add because I, I, I want to I clarify just for anyone who's like, oh, well, that's easy to do if maybe they report to me or if right. it's a, a peer yeah. or whatever. The conversation that I was laughing at was a call I had with the CEO of a client of mine. Okay, so I'm working with the entire company and it was a call with the CEO and it was trying to delegate stuff that they didn't want to do to me. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> time out, time out. Right? So, I mean, that, that can be a very high risk situation. It's, it's right. how you handle it. Um, right. So if you're dealing with your boss, you can still, still do it in a way that's firm, respectful, Absolutely. and, and co-creative. Well, we've come to our end, and everyone knows that I'm a stickler for our timing, and Jen does. Um, feel free to, if you have any additional questions, we'll get them to Laura and Louise. And our conversations don't just end today. We hope that you'll join us on more of our programs, on all of our programs. Um, next Wednesday, we're actually discussing a book, Talking to Strangers. I have two of our, our TCI leaders that are going to lead that for me because I'm going to be just coming out of the hospital with hip surgery. So I'm going to miss my first big, big ideas beyond the book. And it's wine. It's in the evening. Um, normally we're on Miami beach together, but we won't be. And anyhow, just, um, if you have any questions about the Commonwealth Institute and any of our programs, please reach out to me or to Jessica. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend and a wonderful rest of your day. And Colleen and Maureen, I'll see you on the top women call shortly. So thank you to our experts, Louise and Laura. I have two. Yes, please. I have, 
I have two, two, two requests. Okay, the first is um, I would ask that all of us today be mindful of when we are not assuming positive intent and to then shift and assume positive intent. And I mean, that could be with, you know, your spouse, partner, mother, father, anybody, you know, just be, be very mindful of that. So there's that. And then my, my second request is, may I take a screenshot of this and share it because I'd love to uh, hand it over to my team so that they can share it on social media. So that was my second, because I don't want to do that without asking permission. So may I sure. do that? Well, I'm, I sure. And, and I share the I'm video. Good. I'll put our, this video of the converse, the questions and answer section. Um, I'll put that up on YouTube too, but go ahead. Okay, great. Yep. So everybody put your biggest smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone. It. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. All your wisdom and guidance. Bye.